Hey folks, this is Linda Shenton Matchett and this is another episode of Moments in History. It's an opportunity for you to uh, learn some more about history, mostly World War II. For those of you who are not familiar with me, I am an author of Christian fiction, mostly set during World War II. And with all of the research that I have conducted for my books, I have discovered lots and lots of information that I would love to share with you because uh, A, it makes no sense to dump it all into the story, uh, and B, um, there's just so much of the information. So uh, for tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about women war correspondents. Uh, July is my book birthday month for my mystery book that is called Under Fire, and it's about a small town journalist that ends up going over to Europe to follow clues about her sister's disappearance. So in all of conducting all of that research, I found quite a bit of information about the women war correspondents, and I wanted to share that with you tonight. So without further ado, um, just to let you know, there is a little bit of history in the U.S. of women owning newspapers. Uh, that goes back to even before the colonial times. But the reason that usually happened was because... Um, a husband or father or brother passed away and the woman actually inherited the newspaper. So it was not that she started out owning the paper, but she inherited it. Uh, in fact, one woman, and shame on me, I can't remember the lady's name, but she inherited the newspaper in lieu of her son because he was a minor. And so she managed the newspaper until he reached the age of maturity. And then he did take the newspaper over from her. And, um, so there were throughout history, there were certainly some uh, women reporters. You may be familiar with Nellie Bly, who went was one of the first investigative reporters, and she went undercover in as a patient in a mental institution in order to get her story. So there are some women throughout history who managed to make the break and write about quote unquote real news, um, but they were certainly few and far between. Um, and they, the uh, ladies were referred to as being allowed to write about food, family, <laughs> furnishings, and fashion. So those are the four areas, the four Fs that these ladies wrote about. Um, so during World War II, uh, there was much news to be had, and women raised their hands and said, we want to be part of the ability to report this war. And so the military said, well, you have to be certified just like the guys. And certification required quite a bit of background check. Um, hey, Joanne, good to see you with us. I'll try and keep my ums and ahs to a minimum, but I get my brain moves faster than my lips sometimes and I get turned around. So uh, talking about World War II and um, where is she? Margaret Bork White. And I've got some photographs I'm going to show you. This is Margaret Bork White, and uh, she was a photojournalist. And most pictures that you see of her are of her carrying her camera. Can you imagine schlogging that thing around uh, with you, trying to cover combat? Um, but according to Margaret, um, after the certification process was done, even your ancestors had no secrets from the government. That was how far back that they dug. Um, once a journalist was accredited, it acted like a contract, and the Army or Navy would agree to transport the individual into the various areas where the reporter had been approved to go. They would feed them and they would transmit their articles as long as the reporter adhered to censorship rules as well as military rules and regulations. So they were very strict about that. And if a reporter broke any of those rules, they would be stripped of their credentials and sent home. Um, now, the military was not real happy about the women being accredited, and uh, of the almost 2,000 reporters that were certified, 127 of them were women. So that was kind of a big deal, the fact that that many women were able to cover the war. And uh, the bulk of them did cover what we would call the home front, so they would be in perhaps England, uh, which didn't really have battlegrounds, but there certainly was war going on with the bombings and everything else that was happening. But um, needless to say, the fact that they were not allowed near, well, they were allowed near combat, but most of the commanders refused to take them. 
So this frustrated the women to no end, needless to say. Uh, Martha Gellhorn, and this is Margaret, uh, excuse me, Martha, she is Ernest Hemingway's third wife and um, certainly was considered by many to be one of the greatest war correspondents of the 20th century. And she said, I have too frequently received the impression that women war correspondents were an irritating nuisance. I wish to point out that none of us would have our jobs unless we know how to do them. And this curious condescending treatment is as ridiculous as it is uh, undignified. So she had a lot to say about that. She also wrote a letter to the military authorities at one point and said, it is necessary that I report on this war. I do not feel there is any need to beg as a favor for the right to serve of, as the eyes for millions of people in America who are desperately in need of seeing but cannot see for themselves. This young lady, and don't they look so young, this is Marguerite Higgins. Um, and she actually went on to win a Pulitzer Prize for her coverage of the Korean War. Um, but she says, it is necessary that I report on this war. I do not feel there is a need uh, to be, excuse me, that was Martha. She, she covered World War II, and in the process of trying to get to the front, she had a colonel that told her, uh, that she had to leave because there could be trouble. And she said, I would not be here if there were no trouble. Trouble is news and gathering news is what I do. So these ladies were kind of pistols. Um, they had lots to say. This is Mary Walsh and she is Ernest Hemingway's fourth wife and ultimate widow after he killed himself. He apparently liked to marry journalists. Um, a friend of hers named Ruth Cowan was an, a journalist, and she wrote a letter to the president of the American Correspondence Association that said, I would like to submit a memo on the difficulties we women war correspondents are having attempting to report on the activities of Americans at war. We are being stopped from doing a first-class workmanship job. Instead, we're forced in the position of wrangling and fighting to do our jobs, all I want to do is my job. Now, um, have you heard of any of these ladies? Mary Welsh, uh, Dickie Chappelle, Marguerite Higgins, Martha Gellhorn. They had pretty amazing careers, um, but unfortunately a lot of them have, have been long forgotten because of the length of time since they were writing. But uh, I'd, be, I'd be interested to hear if any of you have ever heard of these women. Um, so, despite the fact that the military tried not to get these women up to the combat zones, um, these women did manage to get there. Uh, sometimes the front shifted, and lo and behold, they were already in uh, at the front. Sometimes they did manage to get someone to write a letter of introduction that allowed them to go into combat areas. And sometimes they got there by hook or by crook. And uh, there are some interesting stories uh, Martha Gellhorn, let me remind you who that is. There's Martha. She is Ernest Hemingway's third wife. Um, she actually wanted to cover the invasion at Normandy. And she was told no, so she stowed away. She snuck on board uh, a hospital transport trip uh, <laughs> ship and ended up hiding in the, the bathroom. She hid in the head for the entire journey. I can't imagine how uh, uncomfortable that is. Um, and then she um, impersonated a stretcher bearer in order to get out onto the beach at Normandy. Um, so she got her story, but she did lose her credentials. Now at some point she did get them back, and my understanding is you have to make lots of promises and lots of apologies for that to happen. Um, but again, she broke the rules and she did lose her credentials for that. But her comment to that, I followed the war wherever I could reach it. So again, these ladies were very, very driven. Um, Dickie Chappelle, another young lady. Again, doesn't she just look like a youngster? Uh, she got accreditation to go to the Pacific. And uh, she said, I want to go as far forward as you will let me. And that managed to get her all the way to Iwo Jima. 
and she got an assignment to photograph the use of whole blood in saving lives. That was a big deal. Uh, the use of using blood and whatnot was, was very new back then. Uh, we take it for granted today, but that was very new back then. And so she, um, she, she followed the story to follow the blood and getting those stories. But she actually talked herself into getting into some hospitals she was not supposed to be in. Uh, and she was arrested, shipped home, and again, lost her credentials. However, she did manage to make her way back to uh, the good graces and again, did cover some, some things. Um, Margaret Bork White, again, our lady with the camera. Uh, she was denied access. She asked to go to North Africa and was, uh, and was denied and was told that it was too dangerous for women to uh, fly in airplanes over the channel. So she said, okay, if I can get there, can I cover it? And they said, yes. So she said, fine. And she took a ship, which was immediately torpedoed when they left uh, the harbor. So apparently they were barely out of the harbor. I don't know if that was a matter of hours or, or days or what, but they were not far out of the harbor and they were torpedoed and uh, the ship went down. So she dragged her camera uh, and got into the lifeboat and ended up doing a story about the dangers of traveling overseas during wartime. She obviously had um, up to the minute and personal experience that she could share. So um, she did ultimately get permission and she became the first American to fly in a combat mission. And that was in January of 1943. Um, and there are quotes and stories that I was able to find online from soldiers and other folks who watched her drag these cameras around. And one of them said, um, she dragged her camera and tripod through sniper fire to expose exposed ridge tops to make panoramic shots of the fighting during an Italian campaign. Passionate about what she did, her comment was, work to me is a sacred thing. Again, another driven young woman uh, in the ranks of the, um, here we go, of the Women War Correspondents. Now this young lady, this is Claire Hollingworth. She actually uh, was the first correspondent to break the news of the invasion of Poland. She was out apparently in the countryside and ended up in a Jeep uh, driving around and, and got to the border of Poland and Germany and saw the German troops amassed on the border and jumped in her Jeep, um, got to the nearest village that had an actual telephone where she could use and she made a phone call to notify military authorities that there were German troops on the border um, and then jumped back in the Jeep and went back to the border so that she could cover what happened. Uh, unfortunately, as we know, an invasion is what happened and she was the first on the scene. So she was, uh, she was right there. Um, so Mary Welsh, again, our young lady who was, um, Ernest Hemingway's fourth wife. She had, uh, some pretty incredible experiences as well. Her diary entries state... The devastation was rampant throughout London. It was a time of travesty with 7 million people, traditionally addicts of the outdoors, suddenly burrowing underground. There was the evening when I walked home alone from the Savoy in a fine new black suit. When I got to my flat and looked in the mirror, the suit was gray. It had been a night of incendiaries. I had flung sandbags on a couple of them that were burning along my way and I had thrown myself prone on the pavement walking to and from work. Very matter of fact, uh, writing for someone who had been such a horrific experience. And then another diary entry. Today has brought the usual post-bomb misery, the taste of powder in the mouth, burglar alarms ringing incessantly, glass crunching under our shoes in the flat and also outside, clothes in the closets and drawers heavy with dust, my eyes red and face old looking and feeling as though it were burning and a terrible job to concentrate my thinking. So again, very horrific experiences that these ladies had and then they needed to be able to step back from those experiences so that they could write about them and it, with a journalist's um, uncritical eye and, and to try to be uh, standoffish, but I would imagine that would be very difficult 
because they did have these personal experiences. So these are just a few. Like I said, there were 127 journalists who were accredited, and these were just, uh, I don't know, I think six or eight I talked about, um, that blazed the trail in journalism, investigative journalism. And many uh, a female journalists today and those who covered um, not just the Korean Wars, but the Vietnam Wars, um, the war, the De Desert Storm, um, Operation Freedom, all of those wars that female reporters were able to do is thanks to these women who did this trailblazing. And this is just a tiny glimpse of, of who they were and what they had to experience, because in addition to the atrocities of war, they also fought a war of acceptance, as we talked about. Commanders refused to take them on board or where they wanted to go into combat, continuing to say, no, we, we will not let you go there and do your job. Um, and they had some real grit and were willing to kind of do whatever it took to do, to do their job. Um, there was a speech in 1944 that was given, and May Craig um, was uh, one of the higher-ups in this press club, and she said, the war has given women a chance to show what they can do in the news world, and they have done it well. Fifty years later, BBC correspondent Lysie Doucette said they did it not just because they were exceptional women, but because they were great journalists. And I would have to agree. And I hope you do, too. So thanks again for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed tonight's information about women war correspondents. Um, if you want to see a uh, rebroadcast, this will be uploaded to my YouTube channel that you can find. And... Um, if you are interested in history like I am, you may wish to stop by my blog, which is www.lindashentonmatchett.com. And on that page, you can also sign up for my newsletter, where I also share book reviews and links to free ebooks, as well as historical tidbits and that sort of thing. So again, it's www.lindashentonmatchett.com. And I hope you'll join me again next week at 645 for more Moments in History. Thanks a lot and have a great week.